This video is about forest health and tree thinning in an urban wilderness. It was filmed at the Jones State Forest in Conroe, Texas. For thousands of years before the arrival of civilization, forests stayed healthy and were constantly changing and regenerating themselves through natural cycles of drought, disease, fire regimes, and ecological succession. However, in an urbanized environment, the rapid encroachment of civilization interferes with these natural processes. Forests, such as Jones State Forest, are no longer vast expanses. They are fragmented by roads, impacted by human activities, and affected by pollution. Understory vegetation is much denser than it was historically because wildfires are suppressed. And when wildfires do occur, they burn hotter and often are catastrophic because of vegetation buildup. To maintain a healthy urban forest, it is necessary to use best management practices that mimic natural processes and also address the needs of the rapidly changing dynamics in the forested landscape. Timber thinning is one of these management practices. It removes weak, drought-stricken, dead, and selected healthy trees, providing more resources to the remaining residual trees. Susceptibility of the forest to insects, disease, and catastrophic wildfire is also reduced. Thinning enhances endangered species habitat and at the same time provides wood products for human use. Hughes Simpson with the Texas Forest Service explains the equipment that is used. On your typical harvesting operation, you're going to have a shearer, which is also known as a feather buncher. This is the piece of equipment that actually goes up and harvests a tree. It can go in and, and harvest a tree, grab a hold of it, harvest another one, and, and hold those in place back out and drop it in a specified location. This is very important to maximize efficiency on the operation. The other type of equipment that you also see is what they call a skidder. This is the machine that picks up the failed timber and transports it to a central loading facility. At the loading facility, you have what they call a CTR, which delims, takes all the limbs off of the logs and cuts them to the appropriate length and then a loader actually loads those onto a truck for delivery to the mill. This seems a lot different. When I think of logging, I'm thinking of axemen and people climbing up high in trees and you know it, it only takes less than a minute for a tree to be cut. Certainly Ken, and, and this uh, type of business we're, we're talking about production efficiency but at the same time we're focused on environmental considerations so what you see on TV is not necessarily what always occurs in real life especially in the south. Generally you're looking for on a thinning operation you're looking for the poorest quality trees that are out there. You want to leave your best and remove the, the thinnest suppressed forked trees so that you can provide more nutrients and more resources to your better trees. You don't want to leave the poor trees because they're not they're never going to recover. They're going to continue to be poor trees. So we remove those trees and we take out our better tree or our we leave our better trees. This long straight row right here that has been harvested, this whole strip of trees was harvested. That's for an efficiency purpose that also helps improve the productivity of the site, the health of the site, and it's also important for wildfire prevention and suppression activities in the future. It provides us good access. It also allows a natural break in the fuel source for, the, uh, for any potential fires that could start in this area. Hughes, we're at a stream now. Tell me about tree thinning practices near streams. Yeah, Ken, this is Rice Branch right here, a perennial stream, means it, it flows year-round. So it's very important that when we're conducting our harvesting operations that we keep in consideration uh, water resource protection. So what we have is basically a streamside management zone. This is a buffer strip of trees 
50, at least 50 feet wide on each side where we practice selective harvesting and management, special management within inside this particular zone. This streamside management zone is designed to buffer this stream from any potential runoff, filters the runoff water before it enters the stream, allowing clean water to go in. It provides stability to the banks. It provides aesthetics to the general uh, view of, of the forest, a, a greater biodiversity. It provides shade to our stream. You see how shady this stream is? This helps maintain ideal water temperatures for aquatic organisms that live in the stream. It also provides habitat for wildlife. So a lot of benefits come from streamside management zones. It's important to remember that you can do forest management practices even with an endangered species on the property. You just have to do it in the correct way and remember to leave enough habitat behind, the proper amount of habitat and the proper type of habitat. And for the red cockaded woodpecker that means large, old, mature pine trees in an open stand. And when we're doing thinning operations such as this, we can do those since we're not directly in a woodpecker area right now because these trees are a lot too younger than what they need. We can do that just about any time of year as long as we're not right next to the woodpecker areas. But if there are woodpeckers right near this area, we need to do it not during the nesting season, which is roughly March through July, but a time of year like this. And the fall is a good time, uh, one time that you can do it because we're not interfering with their nesting season and we're not interfering with their uh, normal day-to-day -day habits of going out foraging looking for food. The red cockaded woodpecker is different from other woodpeckers in that it makes the cavities that it roosts in at night and that it nests in during breeding season in live, large, old pine trees. Other woodpeckers are going to use dead trees or cavities that have already been made by other woodpeckers in live trees. But these woodpeckers use live pine trees. They need the larger, older pine trees because if they're going to make a cavity inside the tree, it has to be of the right size to where they could construct the cavity inside the heartwood, the center part of the tree. Well, these trees look pretty small. Would they make RCW homes? Not the way they are right now. We have to plan for the future. That's why we want to come into stands like this and thin out the trees. But in a red cockaded woodpecker area, you don't want this tall mid-story there. They like open park-like stands. And uh, one thing a logging operation would do here, the thinning would help to knock some of this back. You can also follow up with fire that would knock some of this mid-story back because if it gets real tall and dense in here, if the trees are large enough for the woodpeckers to use, they won't feel safe in here. They won't use the area because the mid-story is so high, they're more vulnerable to predators and it doesn't have an open flyway, flyway which they like. So more open, less dense stand with a lower mid-story would be more beneficial to the red cockaded woodpecker and let more sunlight come through and it also allow more fruit bearing plants to come up like this American Beauty Berry right here. That is another food source for red cockaded woodpeckers as well as a number of other birds and other wildlife out here. And once more sunlight gets down to the floor when you open up a stand like this, once that sunlight gets down to the forest floor, you can get more of a herbaceous layer, a lower layer of herbaceous green plants and that is good breeding grounds for insects and when you have a lot of more insects and they're going to crawl up the trees that's more food for the woodpeckers and other animals as well. Donna I understand that this area was thinned about uh, six years ago? Yes Ken it was thinned six years ago it was an older stand didn't have woodpeckers in it at the time but it was thinned six years ago uh, they burned this stand this past March which would be uh, six months ago and a few months ago I found three completed active RCW cavity trees. This here a good example of them building in a live pine tree working on the uh, sap wells here where they pick the little resin wells and have sap come down it leaves a sticky sap on the outside to protect them from their major predator the rat snake. So it's a good example of when you open up a stand make it more natural looking uh, reduce the competition, reduce the mid-story. The fire helped keep the mid-story down here, the uh, smaller trees and brush that could grow up and cause the woodpeckers to leave. That's been kept down with fire. So it's a good example of the woodpeckers coming in, moving into a new area 
because the habitat was managed and made to be just right. And you can still see hardwood trees in the background, leaf hardwood trees for other wildlife and even the red cockaded woodpeckers can use it. And uh, it really looks nice out here. Immediately after tree thinning, wildlife returned to investigate. The wildlife return? Hey, it's already back. I saw some coon tracks over here that are on top of the truck tracks that were brought here yesterday. Okay, so where are the coon tracks, Donna? Right here. You see the tire tracks that were here? Probably put down yesterday when they were logging. But the coon's been on top of them, probably came through last night. So this, these are coon tracks right, right. here? And they're right up there? Neat. At the end of my visit to the forest, Hughes showed me the Texas Forest Service Best Management Practices book. The book provides guidelines to protect water resources during any type of forestry operation. It may be downloaded from the Forest Service website. Ken, this is uh, our Texas Forestry Best Management Practices. This is how we make sure that we protect our water resources on harvesting operations like this. It basically provides guidelines for us to, to follow and consider on any type of forestry operation, whether that's uh, mechanical site preparation, a chemical application, prescribed burning, harvesting, whatever, uh, we cover it with our, with our guidelines which are designed to protect water resources. By managing forest lands in a manner that mimics natural disturbances, we have the opportunity to improve the health of the forest, improve habitat for wildlife, and also provide the wood products that we all rely on every day.